Welcome to a special, special Saturday edition of Anglican Unscripted. Men in Black, what is it now, in, uh, Series 4 or something like that? Kevin and George are going to sit down and talk about some of the most interesting topics in the world. Money, the church, scandal, controversy, conspiracy. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And today's February 28th, 2015. Okay, episode, what is it, 163, and we're going to talk, oh, hurry up, George, come on, wrap them up. We're going to talk about live long and prosper, you got it? Oh, right, I got good. it. You got it, good. Can you do I this? I need scotch tape, to, no, no, I can't, oh, I can't, okay. and I, I need scotch tape to hold these two outer fingers together. Well, this blonde, uh, blue-eyed guy is a little bit more Vulcan than you are, all right. And, <laughs> and, and, and what am I, blonde and... Uh, yeah, that's right. And... Uh, and <laughs> You do have odd hair under, under the sliding. We could have covered an episode about whether you're gold and white or, or black and blue, but we're going to talk about Leonard Nimoy, who's uh, passed on. Yesterday, uh, sometime about uh, two or three, the news broke that uh, Spock, uh, the second most fa- famous alien in the world, had passed on. Uh, and uh, there's a sadness because he was an icon. And we're going to uh, be able to bring him into an Anglican unscripted episode by by crossing lots of rivers and bridges to make references to Leonard Nimoy as the other alien who was not Episcopal. Or well, Episcopal. we are going to get there, Kevin, yeah. through this study. Because let, let's first start off, how are we going to get to this to be an Anglican story? Okay. Follow us, folks. Yeah, if I, you, we, let's explain this first. And now, in 2003, a friend of this show, a friend of ours, Kim Lawton, yeah. of Religion and Ethics Weekly, the PBS mm-hmm. uh, weekly Sunday morning religion show, uh, did an interview with Leonard de Nimoy, and she asked him about his faith, and he was raised in a Jewish household, and and how his Judaism has influenced his life and his career. And one of the things that he shared was that the Vulcan symbol, that is, everybody knows what this is if you're an American of a certain age, comes directly from Judaism. Mm-hmm. What? Vulcans are secret Jews? No, no, they're not. No, they're not Freemasons either. But here, follow me on this. Evidently, in the beginning of the series, there was an episode where Spock has to go back to Vulcan to get married. Mm-hmm. And they were discussing how to do the marriage ceremony and scene. And Nimoy was saying to the producer that, no, it really wouldn't make sense to have a human-type wedding where they kiss or they touch each other because Vulcans are very restrained and they're, they don't really have touchy feeliness. Uh, they're not charismatic Anglicans from Virginia. <laughs> well... He and the, and they and the, the uh, Gene Roddenberry said to uh, Leonard Nimoy, "Well, what do you suggest?" And Nimoy said, "Well, why don't we just make this symbol?" Now, and they said, "Perfect!" And they ran it, and ever since, it's been now the Vulcan symbol. Mm-hmm. Actually, this is the Jewish symbol for the letter Shin, which is the first letter of Shahade and uh, Shekinah, the spirit. And in the in uh, synagogue. The rabbi, when they do the high priestly prayers for the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah, they make the Vulcan symbol, put their hands down like that, and close their eyes and pray, and ask the Holy Spirit come into this place. Now, did you know that when you were doing this, you were making the Hebrew letters Shin, (laughs) and replicating the high priestly prayer of the rabbi? We get to speak about Leonard Nimoy because I said he was the second famous uh, alien to die. Who was the first? (laughs) What was that? (laughs) I was going to say Mark from Ork. I was going to say there's an alien trying to come out. Robin Williams. (laughs) Yeah. And Robin Williams was an Episcopal. There you go. (laughs) There, folks, we've gotten from Leonard Nimoy's death on Friday to Robin Williams, to the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Communion. Yep. So we thought we could talk today about the gospel of live long and prosper. Uh, hashtag LLAP has been going around the internet, uh, Twitter for uh, about uh, 24 hours now, 22 hours. And so it's great time that we can talk about LLAP because that is what the church and the West has adopted as their gospel. 
And I can point out the Church of England because they're, they're demanding now that there be a living wage. I can talk about the fairness and welfare component going on here in America. Let's talk first about what the real gospel message is. It's not live long and prosper. It's, well, let's use John uh, 3.16. What is the real gospel narrative, George? Well, Kevin, I'm not a Baptist, so uh -oh. if I get the wrong passage, you'll have to forgive me. I mean, we didn't study the Bible in seminary. Oh, I'm sorry. We studied social justice issues, not the Bible. I mean, come on now, Kevin. We're Anglicans here. Well, I'll, give, I'll give you a hint. For God. Somebody once, to, somebody once <laughs> told me, and I remember this, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son to the end that all men should be saved, Ooh. that we all believe, that we all come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I didn't learn that at Yale Divinity School, of okay, course. I'm sorry to hear I picked that. that up somewhere else. You did. And so there's a competing narrative. One is to live long and prosper. The other is, the gospel narrative is, Jesus came that all men may be saved uh, through faith in, in uh, the living God. And actually, those are competing and contrasting ideas of the gospel. One is that uh, you should have a good economic standard, you should have a great wage, you should be competitive at work, um, and you should live long and be healthy and eat the right diet. Um, and, and the other says, no matter who you are, whether you're a master, whether you're a slave, whether you're a Jew, Gentile, black, white, whomever you are, Jesus came that you may be saved. He died so that you could live has nothing to do with the economics, has nothing to do with politics, has nothing to do with um, all the westernized freedoms you and I understand. Nothing to do with health care, Obamacare. Um, it's so completely alien, oh, I get to use that word again, uh, to what we have understand now as uh, uh, the gospel. So right now, Leonard Nimoy's gospel is, is winning. Uh, what's, the, what's this going on over in the Church of England? Well, the uh, Church of England House of Bishops released a 50-plus page pastoral letter, mm -hmm. which, as Peter Old uh, has remarked, is longer than Paul's letter to the Romans, but it's not quite as well thought out. No, I don't think so. Uh, where basically that's the message of the Church of England, live long and prosper, that the gov that businesses should offer a living wage, not just the minimum wage, but the living wage, that they should pay money to enable everybody to own a house and a car and a TV sets and all this and that. And of course, when the Church of England does that, what's the first thing a good reporter does? He looks to see if they are actually living up to their own <laughs> demands that other people do this. He looks for hypocrisy. Uh, and what do they find? Get it, capital it. H. Canterbury Cathedral's hiring jobs, and not one of those jobs pays a living wage. Uh, the Church of England does not pay its employees living wages if they're in secular jobs, mm -hmm. and yet the Church of England's bishops are demanding that businesses pay a living wage. Well, the Church can defend itself because, you know, we survive on government handouts and the gifts of our parishioners, and we have to be prudent with our money, so we should be exempt from paying a living wage because we can't afford it, but everybody else should pay one. See what happens when you kind of lose the real gospel? You know, the real gospel is so much different than um, the live long and prosper gospel. And the Church of England, the Roman Catholic Church, um, most churches have uh, idealized this this fairness component. Now, I believe we all are created with this this little DNA gene that says, it's not good if it's not fair. Everything has to be fair. I have a da daughter in college, and she's all about everything being fair. Dad, that's not fair. And y you know that you're about to win an argument when she says that. Because in reality, fairness is an idea that you and I impose on a situation. God thinks of fairness in much different realm than we do. He has a plan that does not exist for uh, minutes, hours, or weeks. He has a plan for all mankind, and that doesn't include our idea of fairness, George. Mm. Uh, there's so much to say about this topic. I mean, we can... now let's just start on one little little thing. Sure. Are the bishops of the Church of England being hypocrites, yes. saying one thing and doing another? Well, 
I don't think they'd be hypocrites because I don't think they actually have thought this through enough to say, well, we're going to say this out loud, but we don't really believe it ourselves. Mm -hmm. They truly believe this stuff, but they're so blind that they can't examine their own lives and see that they're not living that as well. Here's another example. There's a little bit of buzz about the echo bishops. Oh, yes. Uh, Anglican bishops from a far field as Canada and Fiji have flown to South Africa to take part in a global warming consciousness raising effort. Now, if you think this through, uh, flying halfway around the world in jets to protest the use of carbon fuels seems hypocritical. It does. <laughs> now, why not just get on a sailboat and not waste all that jet fuel and you'd still get there? It'd but, take three months. George, what are you using right now? What am I using right now? Skype. Oh, Skype. Skype. Yes. <laughs> it's a whole different world. You know, and so, and so in other words, the bishops get together for a conference where they chat. And nothing really is going to come from this because nobody pays any attention. They may issue resolutions from the diocesan synods that we recommend that everybody sell their Hummers and buy Honda Priuses, but it all is it a Toyota Prius? Toyota. Whatever it, yeah, whatever yeah. it is. They're ugly looking cars. You, you can tell you don't have one, but we are No, I don't have one. And <laughs> you know, but Mercedes has just come out with an electric car that actually if you it but they cost about a hundred thousand yes. dollars. So you can actually buy uh nineteen seventy two uh Dodge yes. for like five hundred bucks, and spend all this money getting eight miles per gallon on your gas, and take like three hundred years until you've reached the cost effectiveness of the Mercedes hundred thousand dollar electric car. Uh, but I digress. No, but the po the point is that the the church is so famous or infamous for having its leaders preach these messages of how other people are supposed to live but they don't live them themselves or they don't or there's special exemptions for the clergy or there's special reasons that our lives are more difficult or more important that we can't be like you and we want everybody to have the same outcome in life except when it comes and affects us well it, to me it points out you know the the bible illiteracy of uh, our clergy our bishops uh, in the Church of England um, and around the world, you know, that we've adopted this uh, LLAP gospel where the, the real gospel is so much different. And we've stopped teaching the other gospel because we don't believe the other gospel. We believe all things should be fair and all men should get the same wage. And um, there, there's an egality of life uh, in this modernity. Well, I could use lots of complicated words there. And we've lost the very reason uh, that our Savior was hanging from a cross. He did not hang from a cross so that I could uh, be part of a union and, and demand higher wages. And it just, it upsets me. So when I hear these messages from our church, when I, when I see uh, popular Western culture accept um, the Leonard Nimoy gospel and, and not the, the Jesus gospel, George. Well, Kevin, the... Uh our critics out there, and you know who they are. We we know who you are. Yes. <laughs> we 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 are just as you are able to watch us. We are able to watch you while you watch us. Well, in my church, which of course is the perfect church, we never do anything <laughs> wrong. Never ever 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 ever. I never preach politics from the pulpit. I never do. I never tell people what to think about social issues around there. I preach the gospel, and I focus on what the Bible tells us, what Jesus tells us. Now, how does that play out in our congregation? We have a massive social ministry where we you know, feed people with our food banks. We work with the local schools and helping children who are homeless. We have programs where we lift people out. And we're not trying to change the culture. We're trying to change people and hoping that by changing people, the culture will change. Bringing them the good news of Jesus Christ means that we love them as much as we love ourselves. And we want for them to know God's love and power and for us to be able to help them. Think of all the cliches. It's better to teach a man how to fish than to give him a fish. It's all true. It is true. It works. <laughs> well, you can turn a life around by introducing them to the power of Jesus Christ. But we have a number of people who live in a local residential setting for adults with uh, cognitive disabilities. Mm -hmm. It's not fair that they are retarded. Well, I can't say that word anymore. Mm -hmm. Retarded, special, disabled, 
different. It's not fair. But God calls us not to rail against the world that, oh, that not it terrible that they're this way, but rather to reach out and love them and include them and realize that God loves them. And it, we're not able to do anything about Down syndrome among adults, but we are able to have them live in the fullness of life in Jesus Christ in relationship with other Christians, mm -hmm. where their disabilities don't matter. See, it's... Um, well, I'm getting on my soapbox, Ken. Well, that's right. Pull it out from underneath. We've we, we, we got 30 seconds to finish up here to, to make our 15-minute quota. One of the things the church has done recently is to, to unemploy the Holy Spirit. It is our job to preach the gospel. It's our job to make people know exactly why Jesus came. There's a role the Holy Spirit plays in this, and that's illuminance, and that's to, to increase our faith. And we, we kind of leave the Holy Spirit unemployed because we're not preaching the gospel anymore, and we don't care if people have faith as long as there's fairness in the world. I, yeah, hold it. Kevin, I've got to argue with you. I'm sorry. Uh oh I have been to press conference after press conference <laughs> at the Episcopal Church's General Convention. Yes. Where I have been told that this vote on this issue is an act of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. The Holy Spirit is at work in the Episcopal Church because we have voted to free Abu Mumia Jamal from death row in Philadelphia because he murdered a policeman and the Episcopal Church believes the Holy Spirit is telling them that this is a miscarriage of justice. The Holy Spirit is what the Episcopal Church <laughs> sins against by taking their, our own minds, our own wills, our own wishes, and ascribing them to God's power and glory. Mm -hmm. And we can think of silly things General Convention does to the Church of England's bishops saying, God is speaking to us and saying, pay a living wage, to flying to Cape Town to protest against people flying to Cape Town. It all comes down to the same thing, that arrogance, that brokenness, that not knowing that God is in charge and not ourselves. Mm -hmm. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And I want you to live long and <laughs> prosper anyway. <laughs> anyway. But this is episode 163 of Anglican Unscripted.